Yes, I'm not sure if everyone is back, but uh, we're going to have the poster prize announcement. So without further ado, I will give the word to the chairman of the poster prize award committee, <laughs> Stefan Sauscher. Okay. Thanks, Lars. So it's my great pleasure to announce the poster prize winners. And uh, first, I would like to thank all of you who have participated in this, I guess, poster presentation for presenting fantastic posters. It was actually quite difficult for the committee, which was um, which was uh, Professor Rita Diaz from University of Trondheim and also Professor um, Alexander Lubartz, uh, Lubartz from uh, Stockholm University who looked at these posters. And um, so we had 15 posters and we had a hard time between the three of us to make it through most of them. And um, so without further ado, this poster prize is also uh, sp sponsored by the journal Biointerface. And uh, Biointerface is, is a journal out of the large family of journals from American Institute of Physics, AIP, it's the publisher. And um, I'm on the editorial board and in the past, and also I guess continuing this tradition, uh, we go to conferences and uh, sponsor poster prizes of course, to advertise the journal, but also to essentially bring uh, readership to, to biointerfaces. So if you have time, uh, take a look. There's some material outside about this uh, journal. It is uh, focused on sort of a quantitative understanding of the biointerface in the broadest sense. And um, usually the publication times are fairly short, and um, I think it is a, it's a, a pretty good journal. So. Um, all right, so for the second prize, um, we decided on the poster number four, uh, entitled Effect of Additives on the Packing in the L-Beta and L-Alpha Phases of a Lamellar Cationic Surfactant System, and that's by uh, Mr. Rui Gonsalves. Is, is he here? Congratulations. Thank you. And um, <clears throat> there you go. So that, that price is at uh, uh, two hundred dollars. US. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Yeah, I should also uh, say that the uh, winners uh, should get in contact with me because I need their email addresses because the uh, prize money will be paid directly through AIP to the, to the winners. And uh, the first prize goes... Poster number seven, single molecule mechanical unfolding probing the effect of a single proton binding to an AC mismatch in RNA hairpins. And that's by Ms. Uh, Lishia uh, Yang. Is she here? Okay. So if she, if someone, anyone knows uh, Lishia, then uh, please uh, let her know that she won the first prize. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. So that's a that's a three hundred dollar prize. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, congratulations to the prize winners. And uh, my name is Ishi Talmon, and I will be the chair of this uh, session. And uh, I was told again by the organizers that I should be tough, as if I needed that advice. <laughs> so uh, please uh, adhere to the time. So the, the first, uh, this first speaker is Stefan Sauscher, and uh, his title is already on the screen. Okay, um, so you saw me switching my hats. <laughs> uh, I would like uh, to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to, to come and present some of our work on uh, polynucleotides and polynucleotide synthesis. And I think what I will tell you, the story I will tell you, is maybe sort of a break of some of the things which we have seen so far. 
um, as I hope to convince you that we have an interesting way, a new way, of making uh, single-stranded DNA polynucleotide block copolymers, and uh, specifically with the focus on drug delivery. So um, <clears throat> generally, my group is interested or works at the interface between engineered systems and biological systems, where we take engineering approaches forward to work with biological systems, but also often take bio-inspiration and bio-tools to engineer systems. So we are right at that interface, if you like. And in the past, we've worked on interactions, for example, of neutralizing HIV-1, neutralizing antibodies with uh, model lipid bilayers, complex model lipid bilayers. We work with bacteria expressing quantum, uh, cadmium sulfide quantum dots, and we characterize these bacterially precipitated materials for their catalytic performance in photocatalysis and photoelectrocatalysis. And uh, the story today is really about sort of a new way of using enzymes to making polynucleotide block copolymers or block copolynucleotides. Now, over the past 30 years, we have seen an enormous proliferation of uh, DNA-based materials. Think about all the DNA origami from 1D to 2D to 3D, um, but also a proliferation of hybrid uh, copolymer systems specifically for drug delivery. And here's one of these examples where you typically have a hydrophobic polymer, synthetic hydrophobic polymer conjugated with a hydrophilic oligonucleotide, of course, forming then some kind of a micellar arrangement, which can be loaded with a hydrophobic drug, but has the advantage of actually having oligonucleotides on the outside now, which are sequenced. And in that sense, you can do hybridization. You can stick polyethylene glycol on. You can put aptomers on. So it's actually a very versatile system. The synthesis, however, is not so straightforward in these systems. Another thing about uh, nucleotides is, of course, that or polynucleotides is that you can use enzymes to make them, but also to shape them. And that's a very nice example here, where you see spherical micelles out of, again, sort of a DNA brush corona which gets chewed down enzymatically and changes the balance between hydrophilic, hydrophobic block links, and then ultimately goes, so these micelles go from spherical to cylindrical, and then we can do hybridize, or one can hybridize on the outside of the corona, again, new nucleotides, and change the balance back into spherical micelles. Another example, particularly also in the area of drug and uh, gene delivery or regulation, are spherical nucleic acids. So these are usually short oligonucleotides sort of grafted onto a gold core at very, very high densities. And uh, these have been quite fantastically successful for gene regulation in absence of cationic polymer co-carriers. And um, again, the synthesis is not so straightforward for these materials. So with that general uh, background, we've also thought about, okay, so how can we apply our tool set, which we've sort of developed over the last couple of years for drug delivery, engineering drug delivery vehicles. So the story I'm telling you is not necessarily a linear story as it develops here. It is that we had sort of tools, and then ultimately we are finding where these tools could be really powerful. And so the goal really is for us to develop anti-cancer chemotherapeutic platforms, which are derived entirely from nucleic acids. So instead of making these hybrid type structures, the idea is, can we make it just all out of nucleic acid? And essentially deliver, selectively deliver, cytostatic nucleotides. So that is an area, again, cytostatic nucleotides have been around for many, many years, like fluorouracil for uh, treating colorectal uh, cancers and so on. Uh, the problem is that these are relatively small molecules. And uh, here is the triphosphate uh, form of it. Um, and uh, these... Uh, nucleosides, or these modified, I guess, nucleotides, uh, as I said, are used for cancer treatment. And they interfere essentially with the metabolism, DNA metabolism and um, uh, nucleotide metabolism, and ultimately kill cells. The problem, again, is they're small, so the and the delivery is not particularly specific, so you need relatively high doses. The circulation lifetime is very low, and um, also they are successful, there's lots of room for improvement. And I think that the techniques I'm showing you today are particularly useful to uh, essentially encapsulate, not, well, not encapsulate, but to incorporate these, nucle these uh, uh, nucleotide analogs 
into sort of larger delivery vehicles. So we are focusing, or later on we'll see that we use fluorouracil as one example, but there are many others. Um, of course, they're also often uh, connected with aptamer uh, uh, targeting units. And uh, in the past, usually it was one uh, nucleotide or a nucleoside linked to an aptamer. So there's really not much of a, of a loading per sort of targeting unit. And I think I can show you that we can change that dramatically. So here's the general idea. Can we start from an aptamer initiator, essentially, nucleotide initiator, and potentially have also functionality on it, which allows uh, to, to add other chemistries, and then polymerize the nuclear uh, nucleotide analog in, for example, fluorouracil um, into the, the growing chain. And then if necessary, append hydrophobes, again, uh, unnatural nucleotides, which are hydrophobic, to ultimately lead to a self-assembly into a micellar system, which then can take um, uh, advantage of the EPR effect and lead to sort of successful and targeted delivery of the polymerized form of this uh, nucleoside or nucleotide drug. So in order to get there, we have to think about how can we actually sort of make DNA. And of course, I mean, there are many, many amplification methods, and it's the mainstay of biotechnology and uh, biochemistry today, which is PCR and rolling circle amplification. They all require a template. It's a polymerase-driven system. It requires a template. So that's not so interesting to us. So how about oligonucleotide synthesis, solid phase synthesis, also an unimaginably successful technique. The problem is really length limitations. You can maybe polymerize 100, 200 nucleotides, and then it becomes rather difficult to, to do anything. We are thinking about much higher molecular weights, potentially. So over the last, I guess, over uh, 12 years now, we have uh, experience with a template-independent polymerase, TDT. Initially, we used it in way back as a way to grow polynucleotide uh, nucleotide brushes from a surface. So it's an enzymatic polymerization uh, reaction. And um, so now we are still using this TDT, which is essentially a transferase, which catalyzes addition of nucleotides at the three prime end without a template. And it is promiscuous, which means it doesn't really care what kind of nucleotide you feed it. So you can feed it natural and unnatural nucleotides. Um, turns out that this is a really powerful way for making polymers, polynucleotides. So the question now is, can we actually realize this drug delivery goal which we, of a system which I just showed you? Well, for that, we need to ask the question, how does the polymerization reaction actually proceed? Can we achieve high molecular weight polynucleotides? Can we achieve narrow molecular weight distribution? So can we control the reaction? Can we start from sequenced initiators? And can we include unnatural nucleotides, particularly, of course, also these uh, um, <coughs> um, nucleotide drugs? Then it becomes a question, can we make amphiphilic diblock polynucleotides and ultimately do these things actually self-assemble the way we envision this? So towards this goal, one of my grad students, now postdoc, worked out the kinetics of the, of the reaction. And it turns out, if we sort of look at the enzyme kinetics, then that has been rather well described for TDT, but not from the perspective of polymer science or polymer synthesis. Uh, yet, what we are seeing is actually a reaction which is a living chain growth polycondensation reaction, which follows the typical, or has the hallmarks of a typical living polymerization reaction, which means that all the initiators are initiated very early on in the, in the reaction, that each sort of growing chain is again the next initiator, the macro initiator for the next step. The enzymes in this case are distributive. They essentially hop on and off statistically from the growing chain ends. There's no termination reaction and there's no branching. So, we have essentially the tool set to describe the kinetics of this reaction. And if you look at that, then we can see that the degree of polymerization in these systems ultimately, when we essentially run these reactions to infinite time, depends on the ratio of the monomer concentration to the initiator concentration. The initiator, again, in our case, is a short oligonucleotide typically. 
So with that, we can essentially set the molecular weight of the reaction products. Now, the next thing here is also what we should expect, a Poisson distributed uh, molecular weight. So it should be pretty much monodisperse what we get out of, uh, out of these reactions. And I can show you that that actually happens. Now, working with these nucleotides uh, is not, or particularly working with the enzyme, is not particularly cheap. So f to make large quantities at the moment is reasonably expensive. So if you're interested in doing light scattering, we would have to produce reasonable amounts of material, which is costly. So we thought about sort of a way around that. And well, everyone has seen, of course, gel electrophoresis for DNA. And um, so here's a slight twist on this. And it's something which we haven't really seen done more routinely. Also, it's very powerful. So here we have a ladder. We have to, of course, calibrate our gel in terms of migrated distance to degree of polymerization, so DP of the nucleotides. And then we can go into the region of interest and using a scanner, a good scanner, and essentially scan this whole region of interest in terms of intensities. So this is the intensity peak. We can translate that then into essentially degree of polymerization. We can do a background correction and get ultimately this nice sort of Poisson peak in the molecular weight distribution out of this. Once we have this, we can of course get DPN and DPW. So this is a very nice way of with very small amounts of material to determine the molecular weight distributions. So that's what we are using. This technique is what we are using to determine molecular weight. So here you see now three different reactions, M to I ratios of 200, 500, and 1,000. So we should expect 200 nucleotides of about 500 and about 1,000 nucleotides being polymerized. These are time courses on the gels. So these are just simply different reaction times. And here is what we find for the PDI of these systems, weight average molecular weight of a number average molecular weight. Okay, so the two lines, the red dashed lines here are 1 and 1.1. And our data lie after sort of an initial, of course, decrease in the uh, increase uh, for, from a larger uh, PDI to a, to a smaller one once the reaction gets into some kind of a steady state. And what you see is that we end up at about 1.05. That's uh, nearly as good as you could expect from any kind of synthetic uh, uh, controlled radical polymerization, for example, or even control living polymerization reaction. In fact, we probably are even better than this, but our gels are also limited in terms of the resolution which we, which we can get. Now, does the kinetics work? And uh, so here we just have a very simple, again, first order kinetic model, which, which describes the data reasonably well. And yes, so for 200, 500, and 1,000 ratios of input, we get back 188, 531, and 1,084. So from a, polym from a polymer science standpoint, this is actually very nice. We have very good control over making these polynucleotides. <clears throat> so we also used uh, NMR to follow the reaction kinetics. And uh, we found that we can improve on this simple, very simple kinetic model somewhat better, even if we take into account that the enzyme actually deactivates as a function of, of uh, turnover. And uh, if you do that, we get a nearly perfect fit to our uh, data. But the reaction kinetics model is considerably more complex. And uh, probably from a practical point of view, not really necessary to use this. Uh, the simple model I just showed you here works perfectly fine. The next question was, can we include unnatural nucleotides? So for example, different functional groups, amine, allyl, and so on. Can we include fluorescent groups? Can we maybe even introduce clickable groups? And uh, it is a resounding yes to all of them. So the enzyme incorporates these unnatural nucleotides. And here what you're seeing is different functional groups or differently functionalized nucleotides incorporated at different ratios into the growing polymer chain. And what you can see is, for example, for the amine, um, we can have ratios of 0.1, so essentially 1 to uh, 10, up to uh, uh, essentially two, 2 to 1. And they're getting incorporated pretty much at the same, at the same uh, efficiency. For others, when we go to high concentration of unnatural nucleotides, we are losing sort of the incorporation efficiency. And that's just simply how the enzyme actually sort of has a preference for natural versus non-natural nucleotides. Um, 
but again, we can introduce a whole range of, of uh, even very bulky um, uh, nucleotides. So that started or triggered a whole other thought. One, of course, particularly in, in drug delivery, you have to think about nucleus, presences of nucleus in the system and the degradation of these polynucleotides. And uh, we thought, well, if we introduce unnatural nucleotides, will it affect the stability of these uh, nucleotides? Now, generally, what people are doing, <laughs> since the enzymes cut the backbone, is modify the backbones, and in some cases, the sugars on the DNA, but not really the basis. In our case, all our modifications are on the base. So this is actually a really first example of demonstrating that we can use unnatural nucleotides to increase, dramatically increase, the enzymatic stability of these polynucleotide chains. So here we introduced, essentially, or we used exonuclease in these first experiments for different uh, functional groups uh, incorporated into the, into the chain. And what you can see is that even after a short amount of time, generally the, the nucleases did their, uh, did their uh, job and cleaved off sort of these end groups which we attached and decom essentially decomposed the, the, the strand. We found, so, that if we have relatively large functional groups at the end, then the enzymes got frustrated. Um, one of these functional groups was, or two of these functional groups were hydrophobic, and then we were concerned that maybe what we are seeing is sort of a, an inadvertent uh, resistance just because we have essentially a mycelization. Um, so for that reason, we then used also hydrophilic groups, bulky hydrophilic groups, to demonstrate that there's really no difference whether you have hydrophobic or hydrophilic groups. It will stop or it will impede the progress of exonucleases. And uh, here's an example, undegraded single-stranded DNA here on this axis, different types of, of unnatural nucleotides, and you can see the bulky ones are actually preventing the degradation. Now, we can also look into the incorporation density of these unnatural nucleotides, and we can look at this in terms of exonuclease as well as also endonuclease stability. And um, so here you're seeing undegraded single-stranded DNA as a function of degradation time, and what you, you can simply fit these, this data with uh, simple exponentials and get half-life times. And then here we plot the inverse of the half-life time as a function of the density of unnatural nucleotides in these systems. And what you can see is with increasing density of nucleotides, of course, um, our half-life times increase actually quite dramatically, just simply because in this case the exonucleus chews along and then finds an unnatural nucleotide, doesn't know what to do. Eventually it cleaves off and then it continues. Um, the, oops, the, uh, initially, the uh, degradation uh, rate is not that much affected for endonucleases, and the reason for that is just simply that the endo cuts anywhere arbitrarily along the length. But once you reach sort of a sufficient density of unnatural nucleotides, it seems that the backbone flexibility is changing because it doesn't really, really uh, depend on the, the uh, size of the of the uh, base modification. It seems to be rather depending on the distance between these. And supposedly, as we are not sure about this yet, the uh, endonuclease sort of chews on the, on the backbone. The bases rotate actually away from the, from the axis point of the enzyme. So if that distance becomes exceedingly small, the enzyme has a hard time fitting in there. And at that point, you get actually some significant improvement in the half-life time. So the next question was then, does the initiator sequence matter? And for that, we wanted to use aptomers. And uh, here are the experiments with aptomers. So we use two different types of aptomers to just demonstrate, yes, we can polymerize from aptomer initiators, uh, A's and, and T's in this case. So this in generally works. The details of the structure of these aptomers right at the sort of three prime end matters. Um, uh, potentially one has to put in a small linker to give sort of greater flexibility and greater uh, conformational flexibility there so that the enzyme can actually easily access that, that three prime uh, end. So yes, we can use aptomers. Next question was, can we incorporate in our case fluorouracil? And uh, so that is also a resounding yes. Um, so here we just use a CY5 labeled T10, so it's just a 
uh, an oligonuclear type T10 as an initiator. And here we're using these two different aptomers which we had uh, looked at before. And these are different incorporation ratios shown for fluorouracil. And what it shows is that you can actually make a polyfluorouracil, a homopolynucleotide, just with drug. So we can highly uh, polymerize the, uh, the drug. So that's potentially a really important element for sort of effective delivery later on. So really, now we're seeing this sort of progressing towards our goal. So we start with an initiator. We have fluorouracil. We use our TDT to polymerize the system and make a polyfluorouracil. <coughs> okay. The active drug is actually the monophosphate. So we are, of course, putting triphosphates in, but the monophosphate is the active drug, which also helps us here because in the decomposition, directly we get the monophosphate out. So usually in, in the delivery of the, of the uh, fluorouracil alone, we would have to have several uh, enzymatic activation steps required to make it active. And it's an inhibitor of thymidylate uh, synthase, and it leads ultimately to cell death. And this is all very, very preliminary data, which we are getting together with my colleague at Duke, uh, Professor Tosh Chilkori. Um, and what we sort of see is that, yes, co co compared to control, the polymerized form of FDU is much more potent than, um, and it's not shown here also, the free form of the drug. So we are quite excited about this, this, this approach. So that leaves us now with something which we actually looked at it earlier. Um, in terms of time. So this was actually the first part of the study which we did before we looked at the kinetics of the reaction. Um, the question there was just simply, can we make complex polynucleotide architectures? And that goes now to the point, can we actually make block copolynucleotides which self-assemble into my cells? And yes, we can do that. So for example, we can make highly um, heterogeneous amphiphiles which have a very long hydrophilic uh, polynucleotide corona and then essentially a couple of very highly hydrophobic nucleotides being the assembly unit, so BODIPI. These systems self-assemble into star-like micelles, and here are some AFM images for three different types of essentially corona chain links zoomed in. So these are essentially the micellar structures which arise, these star-like micelles which you can see here, which are on the order of about 20, 30 nanometers in diameter, so quite, quite interesting. We can also change the balance between the hydrophilic and the hydrophobic blocks. We can also make crew cut micelles. I just have not shown that here. So together with my colleague Yara Yingling at NC State, um, we looked into actually modeling this assembly. And uh, she had at the time developed a sort of new uh, solvent, implicit solvent ionic strength method for uh, essentially uh, in combination with uh, dissipative particle dynamics. And the idea was, can we model the self-assembly of these systems? So here you see sort of the simulation box. Let's see whether I can, while I talk, start this movie. And uh, the idea behind it was just simply, can can these simulations predict our self-assembly? So one thing we can look at, for example, is just simply the aggregation number. Um, predicted by simulations versus what we actually can measure. And you can see in these stars we have about uh, three to four chains per, per micelle, and that's essentially also what the simulations have predicted. But even further, we can look into sort of scaling law relationships for, these, for the assembly of these star-like micelles also as a function of charge in the system or ionic strength. And what we find is that the scaling of the micellar size should scale with the corona, uh, five, okay, should scale with the corona um, molecular weight to the three-fifths power. And so the DPD simulations are shown here as a function of the corona length. And the hydrodynamic radius from DLS on these micellar structures is shown here on the, on the right-hand axis. And the slopes essentially match what these scaling law predictions would suggest. So it's 0.56 for the, for the micelle from DPD, and it is 0.6 measured from uh, the hydrodynamic radius. So we had some reasonable confidence that actually these DPD simulations capture sort of the essence of the self-assembly of these systems. With that, now as a tool, Yara could go to town and create phase diagrams of these, these 
polynucleotide systems or oligonucleotide systems in this case. So here it's always four hydrophobes and then different essentially lengths of hydrophilic uh, strands um, which, which we are considering and the solvent ionic strength increases from right to left in these systems and what you can see is that you get a very very rich phase behavior in, in, these, in this very simple system even. And I mean, that's very nice because we can go from cylindrical structures to essentially uh, star-like micelles to potentially sort of even more sort of crew cut type uh, structures. And in this box right here, we essentially did experiments to compare what the simulation suggested as a function of ionic strength in terms of the micellar shape. And that is shown here, radius of gyration, again in black, this is now measured with, with static light scattering and in blue, the DPD simulations. And there's a reasonably good match in terms of the size changes in, these, in this micellar system as a function of increasing ionic strength. So you first have essentially a fairly loose structure at low ionic strength. You increase ionic strength, the structure collapses due to charge screening. Eventually you reach salt concentration where there's really not much going on anymore in terms of the overall, um, uh, I guess, uh, shape of the micelle. And then with increasing salt concentration, you get uh, dramatic aggregation. And that, that's also brought out in these uh, AFM images. And uh, I guess the, the sort of last part here is we've also played around with making these micelles responsive. And uh, to that extent, we added in uh, azobenzene, which can flip from a apolar to a polar state through the uh, inter, uh, intervention of UV light and visible light. And um, without sort of going into any details, we used here copper-free click reaction using actually unnatural nucleotides, which we incorporated into the chain, and then essentially are able to use to click on these azobenzene functional groups. And this is just a demonstration that we can switch, oops, that we can switch the system from essentially an, a uh, sort of uh, molecular into an assembled state, so sort of unmodified DNA as a control. My cells form when you essentially are in the trans state. You shine UV light on the system. It disrupts the micelles. You can see that the micellar sort of components are much smaller here. You shine visible light on the system and it reassembles. So with all of this, I hope to have convinced you that we are sort of a step closer to actually realizing this original goal, which I showed you that we can make cytostatic or polymerized cytostatic nucleotides either in form of just simply sort of copolymers uh, or also through copolymers which actually self-assemble into, into micellar systems. And um, so in summary, really, we've shown you facile enzyme catalyzed synthesis of high molecular weight single stranded DNA where we have control of a molecular weight composition that we can make blocks that these systems can assemble into my cells. We have some reasonably good uh, uh, theoretical tools or simulation tools to predict the assembly of these systems. And really, I think that we have uh, potentially here a platform technology for cytostatic nucleotide uh, delivery. And um, I would like to thank Dr. Chilkori, my colleague, and also Yara Yingling at NC State um, for collaboration on this work which was in part also uh, funded through our MERSEC, which is a sort of a large consortium uh, among the research universities in the triangle on soft, focused on soft matter. And uh, also thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We have 45 seconds for questions. Uh, I'll give you grace of maybe a couple of questions anyway. Okay. That's on me. Uh, questions, please. How long can you make these uh, oligonucleotides? Yeah, so what I've shown you here, typically the length was maybe a thousand or below a thousand. That takes about an hour or half an hour. Uh, we've run the reaction 24 hours, I think, and we got over 10,000 uh, units. I think it's just a matter of how long you want to wait and how long you want to feed it uh, nucleotides. Um, as long as you keep your enzyme happy, it will polymerize. So very high molecular weights are possible. That was very interesting. I take the second question, if I may. Uh, did you try to did your self-aggregate self-aggregated particles in in 
real medium, like uh, like in. Uh, Blood, uh, blood yeah, so that's a very ex that's an excellent question. I should have said something about this. No, so far we have not, um, and it's clearly an issue. I mean, uh, the interaction in plasma with plasma proteins of these structures will be critical to see. And you mentioned that yesterday already, how how the system might ultimately perform. But I think we have a lot of tricks up our sleeves to modify these structures to make it more compatible if we need to. I mean, we can pegulate them, we can do all sorts of things with these structures. Thank you. Last question? Uh, Stefan, you are very far from how, what are the next steps to, to apply this clinically? Huh. Yeah, because you have the receptor, everything, mm -hmm. so. Well, the next steps for us are essentially doing live dead assays initially, and yes. then doing some of these experiments I just alluded to, yeah. and then pharmacokinetic uh, studies and distribution studies. Yeah. Um, I mean, then uh, animal experiments. Animal experiments, yeah. yes. And that is sort of the realm of I mean, actually Tosh Chilcote's work because that's, that's what a he complete does. new approach. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed. And Thanks. Uh,